Hello and welcome to episode 287 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Faye and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, how are you doing? I'm good. Very good, Andy. The football season's back. I know. I'm excited. For championship football? Actually, by the time this podcast comes out, Watford have probably already lost their first game because they're the championship opener on Friday night. And we record this on a Friday. Uh, Not always, but we have this week. So, yeah, I can't see into the future. So just in case, wasn't that great win Watford had? Do you know what? (laughs) Being a Watford fan, does that mean that technically before the season starts, you are bottom of the league based on alphabetical order? Almost, yeah. I mean, last year Wolves were in the Premier League, so they were actually under us. But there yeah. aren't many teams. West Brom come up, come. Oh, actually, West Brom. I oh, know they got promoted last. Yeah, so we probably are already bottom. Yeah, Brilliant. there you go. <laughs> Just a bit of optimism for you there, Andy. <laughs> yeah. um, no, apart from that, everything's good. It's been fantastic um, having Harvey on board this week. We've been doing a lot of stuff with Harvey, p- publishing some new content around insurance protection in fact it inspires an important piece on this week's podcast which i'll come on to so that's been fantastic so um onwards and upwards for money to the masses it, yeah. the, the team is ever expanding it's exciting stuff i was uh, just chatting to justin who we talk about in the podcast he's always behind the scenes he has been on the podcast once but i was saying to him just this morning how pumped and excited i am about it sounds cheesy but it's not and genuinely it is yeah. really exciting if your headphones were they're good enough you would have heard justin laugh at my joke just a minute ago and i because <laughs> he's actually in the background as we record this so you shouldn't encourage me taking the mic out of watford so moving on then with the podcast i've already mentioned one piece there with harvey there and that inspired a piece what else are we going to be talking so about? the first piece i want to do is an investment piece and it's about volatility but it's something that other people might not have thought about and it's future volatility and how that can be useful in determining where markets might go next more importantly determining whether we should be battening down the hatches as i explain in the piece it'll be something that people haven't really thought of before the life insurance piece i want to do is relating to the coronavirus world that we live in now now there's a particular issue that's arising and that is that insurers are postponing decisions on people who are applying for life insurance. So we're in this world where we're getting lots of people trying to buy houses, which inevitably that means they're going to have mortgages and presumably need life insurance. We're going to have lots of people who perhaps have lost their jobs that had benefits. They are going to have to try and arrange life insurance for themselves, but equally people who are just generally worried about not having life insurance in place. And coronavirus has been a big wake-up call for a lot of people. But at that time, it's almost been a perfect storm because we've got the point where the insurers are being risk-averse. And what it means is it's making it slightly harder for people to get insurance cover. And so what I want to do is talk through that. People out there who are finding they can't get life insurance, they're being postponed. I'll explain more about postponement, but I want to give them a ray of hope and explain how they can, in fact, get life insurance cover in this current environment. And the last piece, Andy, is over to you. It's just going to be a short piece. We've covered shared ownership before, which is a way to get onto the property ladder if you aren't able to buy a full share in a property. And there's been some changes announced this week. And I just want to run through those and what it means for, um, well, probably first time buyers and new build property. And and a lot of that has gone under the radar because I wasn't even aware of this. And Andy brought this up and that's why it's on the podcast. It'll be an interesting piece for those who are already on the ladder through shared ownership and those who might potentially want to buy a house. Some good news there. Right. So what are we going to start with? Let's start with the investment piece. Now, if you go back to podcast 78, so that's quite a long time ago, and I did a podcast around volatility. So it was why I explained why volatility isn't always a bad thing. I was linking it to targeted absolute return funds. And in that piece, I mean, go back and listen to that show because like we we try not to date any of our podcasts so they're evergreen and the content is um useful even now and i and i talk in that podcast about the fact that yes volatility isn't always bad but you might want to try and and control it within your portfolio but you also need to view it in conjunction with something else like the total return or the price movements on the asset that you're investing in in question and so there are some absolute return funds that do provide low volatility equally low returns they've had a lot of bad press because they can be often expensive funds that don't really do much so you may be better off holding other low risk assets funds or even cash but what i want to do is take the idea of volatility 
and turn it around. So rather than look at the past and uh, historical volatility, because most measures we see out there, whether it's actually in terms of volatility numbers that you see on fund fact sheets, whether it's something like maximum drawdowns, a, a statistic that I actually like, and um, we, we focus on that on the 80-20 investor table. So that's, that's the amount that a fund has fallen in a given week, the maximum amount over a period of time. So that gives you an insight into like the downside risk of a fund. Or whether you're looking at a, a stat like beta, which measures a fund's movement based upon the underlying index that it's benchmarked again. So if that index moves up by, let's say, 1%, then the fund would, would move up in 1% if the beta was 1%. Like, in tandem. So you get a measure. I mean, we've covered it before on the podcast. I'm not going to dwell on it. But looking at past volatility can be useful because let's say you're going to decide to invest in a fund now with the uncertainties that are going on in in market, you might look back to a similar period of time where there's been a similar setup, maybe the macro themes and you might look at how a fund has performed, how it's gone up and down. So volatility, if you remember, is the up and down movement of a price. So that sort of wobble that you see. If the volatility is high, it's very erratic up and down. If it's low, then it's much more stable. And if you look at that volatility in the past, it might give you an indication of what could happen if you get a similar setup in investment markets. Now, what I want to do is change that and talk about forward looking volatility, so future volatility. Now, on the podcast in the past and on Damien's Midweek Market, you may have heard me talk about something called the VIX, the V-I-X. It's an index and it's often called the market fear gauge. And what it does, it's a measure of the market's expectation of 30-day forward-looking volatility on the S&P 500. So in simple terms, if you take the S&P 500, which is the main stock market index in the US, it's a measure of what the market thinks volatility is going to do in the next 30 days. So when the VIX, the value rises, that means the market's expected expecting things to become more volatile. And that's why it's used as a fear index. It's really like a measure of yep, things are going to start getting in a bit shaky, a bit nervy, a bit twitchy. So it starts to rise. If it falls, the opposite is true. Then the market is thinking that things will become calmer. So what that means, if you combine a measure of that volatility, that VIX, and you compare it with the price movements on the S&P 500 at the same time, if you overlay that, I mean, go and look at your stock app, go and look up VIX, and then you go and look at the S&P 500, look at the two charts that you find, and you can see when the VIX spikes gets really high, then it tends to mean the market completely tanks because fear is picking up. And it's about this volatility, this expected volatility picking up. Now, just to give you a broad measure, on the VIX, around about 20 has been a historical average average and before the sell-off at the beginning of 2020 we got way down into the low teens in terms of volatility then it spiked really high and I think we were up about 70 odd when the market was at its weakest and even recently we started to see it pick up again well, now, where does it go to the VIX it, it just keeps going higher it doesn't higher. have a high point no it just it will suddenly just spike and it'll probably get I mean in this year it's 70 I think okay. the highest we got to and you can use that as a benchmark so you, that's pretty volatile. yeah if you look at the history you can see this it's so obvious I mean it's like comparing a plateau to Mount Everest yeah. it's like oh my what is going on here but you start to see it pick up now let me just explain how that VIX works. It's derived from the price inputs of the S&P 500 options. Now, this gives a measure of implied volatility. Now, options, so people understand, are instruments that are based on the underlying value of the asset. So in this case, it's the S&P 500. And they give people the opportunity to buy or sell at a future date. So a call option is, if you have a call option, it allows you to buy an asset at a stated price within a particular time frame you don't have to you can have the option to buy it unlike a futures contract where you do have to buy something and a put option a put a put option is the same as what i just described but it's you you have the option to sell at a future date so what it means is that people can then almost place bets on where they think the market is going to go and the price of these options is influenced by historical realized volatility so what we see going on in i'm talking about the s p 500 here just for example those movements we've seen up and down that wiggly line going up and down when it gets 
really erratic, like around February, that volatility picks up. But there's also a part of it that sort of gives an implied volatility in that overall pricing of those contracts. And that's how they derive the VIX. That's how they derive this future volatility number. And the reason it's interesting, and I'm talking about it, because it can give you a steer if volatility is likely to pick up. So if you go back to the 29th of August this year, and if you're an 8020 investor member, you would have received a newsletter where I talked about some of the charts I'm looking at right now. And one of them was the VIX. And at that point, the VIX had risen to 23.27, which isn't alarming if you've gone back to what I said earlier with the historical average, but it was above the 20 day moving average. So if you average the VIX over 20 days, the prices, and you drew that line continuously it was above that 20 day moving average, which at that point was 22.83. Now, historically, that is a sign when the VIX breaks above its moving average that things could be about to pop. And I pointed this out in August. And three days later, I think we, we had an all time high on the S&P 500. And now if you've been watching midweek markets, you will know that the world imploded in US equities, particularly in tech stocks over there. So particularly the NASDAQ 100. So while investors are used to looking at historical volatility, looking at indices and seeing how they've moved, future volatility, implied volatility is interesting because it could give you a steer that trouble may be coming. So think of it like a weather map. So you know where people do weather forecasting and you start to see things start to pick up. You start to see movements in in air pressure or you might see the, the isobars when you look at those maps. It doesn't mean a storm's going to happen, but when certain things start to happen and the predictive nature of future volatility starts to suggest that the chances are increasing that a, a, an event that could be negative to the actual underlying price of the S&P 500 falling if we start to see things pick up. So the message from this part of the podcast is keep an eye on implied volatility, future volatility on various indices. So on the S&P 500, that is the VIX, the VIX. But you can also see this future volatility which is, again, like I said, calculated from options contracts for nearly anything. So you can find it for Apple share price. So Apple, as the uh, the adage goes, as goes Apple, so goes the market. And so that means that Apple is so influential, so large. I mean, it hit a two trillion market cap recently. It's so influential on the key indices in America in particular, that when it moves and where it goes, it starts to have an impact on the wider index. And where America goes, it tends to be that the rest of the world usually follows. So if Apple starts to turn lower, starts to have issues with the share price, then that normally has a knock on effect. So if you'd looked at the, it's called VX APL. So it's the future volatility of Apple. So it's basically the VIX of Apple share prices. Normally it's in the thirties, Well, if you've gone back in August, in mid-August, it started to pick up. So there were signs that the volatility, the future volatility or the implied future volatility was picking up. So again, think of it like there's a storm brewing, potentially the winds are picking up. And therefore, like you would do if you're standing outside, the winds pick up, you think, oh, it might rain. It's a bit like that. So it started to pick up in August that therefore it could dissipate and then it could calm back down. And actually, you never see anything materialize in the actual stock price of Apple. But as this VIX of the Apple share price increased, it got as high as 66. And then on the 1st of September, Apple share price rolled over. The winds had already been picking up in the background. The storm came, the share price collapsed, and therefore the wider index and US technology stocks collapsed. You can also find figures for, if you Google implied volatility on the FTSE 100, Again, if you ever look at these things, get the chart, look at its shape, look at its pattern and compare it to the underlying index itself. So if you find the implied volatility of the FTSE 100, compare it to the actual FTSE 100 and you can see how the two things behave together. You could find it for the NASDAQ. Now the NASDAQ, VXN it's called, was in its 20s and then it shot up to over 42. So we had a spike. Again, it was a precursor to the market rolling over. And Traders watch these implied future volatility numbers for an inkling that maybe something's starting to go wrong. And like I said, to use the analogy again, the wind's picking up in the background on a sunny day, might might it cloud over and we have a storm. 
doesn't always happen but it's a good indicator that something might be brewing. And in this instance, I'm no Yuri Geller, but what I wrote about at the end of August did come to fruition this time. Just something I'm watching, a bit like you're watching the, like I say, the weather forecast and and the, the wind pick up or whatever, and the storm came. It wasn't guaranteed. So it's something to keep an eye on. Imagine you live in Florida, people are always watching the weather and watching for the, the small winds that are picking up out in the Atlantic that slowly start to pick up and eventually they can become a hurricane. That's probably the best analogy, to be honest, that they watch what's going on thousands of miles away because eventually it could become a problem. Watching future volatility is that such thing. So it's something that is a, another tool for people's investment toolkit and maybe something that people can explore and will find particularly interesting to watch going forward. It doesn't mean watch obsessively, but it's something that actually could give you a little bit of insight. I forgot to say, actually, before we move on to the next piece, Andy, you can look at that future volatility for any asset. I gave examples of equity markets, but it is also in bond markets. Um, You can get it in gold particularly in gold. So just to give an example, the, the, the sort of implied volatility of gold is falling. So at the moment, which means that you might expect a period of calm. But again, these things can just spike and change. But you can get the measures on any asset as well. It's not just equity market. Good stuff. So moving on to life insurance and a little quirk that we found by speaking to people in the industry. And uh, Damon, you're going to explain some more. Yeah. So with Harvey on board, we, I mean, we got a lot of, lot of expertise in the team and we, we go and get people who have particular expertise in the key areas that we, we write content about and help people with. And the whole life insurance protection industry is, is a huge one. It's not just life insurance. And we were talking in the office about one of the issues that has come to light and it isn't being well publicized at the moment, but there will be plenty of people who listen to this podcast who are in a scenario where they need to get life insurance or might want to get life insurance and are struggling to. So to give you an example, you could have a group of people who have maybe applied for life insurance in the last six months. And now we're talking, this is particularly since the coronavirus pandemic has happened. And so there are a whole bunch of people who would have applied for life insurance who may be postponed. So by that, I mean, when you apply for life insurance, usually what happens if you're in a good bill of health, then you would be accepted on ordinary rates is the technical term. Basically, the price that you were quoted, you'd get that. If, like me, you've got something wrong with you, you've got like minus Crohn's, then you can be rated. So it means your premium is higher than somebody who didn't have Crohn's because I'm an increased risk to a life insurance company because of the complications you can get from my particular condition. And so they raise the premium I have to pay a month and they apply that rating normally as a percentage. It could be something like a 50% increase on the standard premium. But there is another perhaps lesser known outcome when the underwriters get to a decision so the underwriters are the people who look at all the information on your personal circumstances financial health records everything all together assess your risk profile they're the people who come to a decision now you can be postponed and what that means is that you effectively they say do you know what come back in a six months and we'll look at it again so it's a bit like when you go out and you're going to the, the club not tonight lads and then you, it doesn't mean you're barred from the pub you've got to come back next week and try again. It's kind of the same thing. And that's what's happened increasingly so in the life insurance world but post coronavirus. And now the reason it's happened increasingly so is because usually you could get a rating up to 250%. So they would push your premium up by up to 250% from the standard rates. And because it could have been any medical condition, there's a whole range of medical conditions out there. Some are much more severe than others and potentially could carry a higher risk of death. But what's happened is that insurers after the coronavirus has hit are starting to look at their risk as a business and are now applying fewer ratings as it stands at the moment it's generally around if they were going to increase your premiums by 100 percent so basically double them from the standard for somebody of your age height and weight etc if they were going to do more than that then they're, they're choosing to postpone you because they're worried about the issues surrounding coronavirus the idea being that coronavirus does tend to impact people who have underlying medical conditions more so than people who don't. And so therefore they're postponing more and more people. So there'll be a lot of people out there who have tried to get life insurance. They may have been one of the people who were shielding during the pandemic. They may have been at home. They may feel pretty healthy, 
but they may have been in a higher risk category and been told they were by the NHS and were told to shield. Now, I know plenty of people. I personally am in a slightly higher risk category because of my Crohn's. And so they may have thought, you know what? I want to get life insurance. It was one of those jobs I was meant to have done. I never did it. So I'm going to go and apply. There may be people who are buying houses as a result of the stamp duty holiday, the whole wave of people trying to buy houses who presumably are getting mortgages and hopefully are taking out life insurance to cover the eventuality that they might die. Or there could be people who be made redundant from a job that had death in service benefits who now realise they've got to pay for that themselves and maybe applying for life insurance. Well, some of those people, like those shielders, may now be getting postponed decisions from insurers and they may be thinking, well, that's it now. I've got to just hope I don't die. Now, if that is you, if that happens to you, then the first thing you should do is speak to the life insurance broker that you use. If you didn't use one, then the life insurance company to understand why you were postponed. And the problem we've also got in this period is that the NHS has or was delaying treatment for lots of people. Now, you would have heard on the news, there are lots of cancer patients that haven't been receiving treatment. There have been people who even in this office, and that includes me, who had scheduled appointments with the hospital for underlying conditions that were postponed, delayed. The problem is if you have something like that that is outstanding and you go to apply for life insurance, then the underwriter may decide, you know what, we'll wait until you've had that operation, that procedure, until we make a decision on whether to cover you. Because the positive of being postponed rather than rejected is, of course, that once that bit of information is in, the underwriters go, oh, yep, that's fine. You don't have to go through that whole process that you've done to apply again. You could then effectively get a decision which hopefully will be to be accepted. Now, I've been postponed in the past. I was once postponed when I took out life insurance because I was going to have to have a, an operation to have part of my bowel removed. And obviously, the, the reality is that if you're knocked out on, the, on an operating table under general and anaesthetic you've got a, a percentage chance you could die so therefore they wanted to wait until I'd done that and then they would cover me I mean that's just a harsh reality sorry for anybody who's about to go and undergo a procedure who are out there but that is just the reality of the situation <laughs> I'm but, not laughing at that situation just the, the horrible sort of uh, <laughs> full stop you put on that and just like by the way <laughs> yeah unfortunately that is just the reality of it but of course once your procedure is done and hopefully you'll be covered. But what I want to do is give a positive message out there for people to how you solve this, because we're not really talking about it in the in the industry, that the fact that there could be this wave of people now who can't get life insurance, who are needing to get life insurance, who want to because of obviously coronavirus being around. And so therefore they perceive their own um, likelihood of death or it has gone up but they can't because of this whole scenario of what's going on with the nhs what's going on with coronavirus and insurers so we've been talking about it here and there are some positive things you can do actually and potentially hopefully if people who listen to this can now try and get some life insurance now there are still some insurers who are still rating people above that 100 percent level so just because you get postponed by one insurer, speak to a broker if you haven't already done so, or if you have, ask them to find out of another broker. They should be able to talk to the medical underwriters before they apply. So the answer is shop around even if you are postponed, but make sure you do before you even apply. The other thing is don't cancel policies before you've got a new one in place. I think some people have been very keen to get a new policy in place. It may be they're trying to rebroke the one they've already got. So rebroke, that was a technical term there. I shouldn't have thrown that in, but basically cut their bills, take out a new life insurance policy that might be cheaper. The issue is if you stop the one you've already got before the one that you're applying for has been accepted, accepted and gone through, you can find yourself in no man's land with no insurance. So there will be, again, people cutting bills trying to get new life insurance. Make sure you get the new cover in place before you stop any existing cover that you've got. And just on that, if anyone is in that situation where they're worried about the fact that they've done that, most insurance companies will allow you to reinstate your old policy within around about three months of cancelling it. So if you've cancelled it within the last couple of months, thinking you've made the wrong decision speak to that insurance company you will have to pay the back premiums you have to catch up the premiums but there is a possibility that you can get that cover back in place most insurers will allow you to backdate for about up to three months so that is a that's a great tip particularly for people who did cut bills very quickly because of unfortunately financial difficulty where 
with maybe they were on furlough or they were uh, made redundant and the situation's improved. The other thing is if you've got existing life insurance in place, do look at your guaranteed insurability option on your policy. And that is a technical term, which you you need to remember is uh, an option that allows you to increase the amount of cover you have, but without any underwriting. So you don't have to go for further tests. They aren't going to look into your medical history. And so it's it's a benefit that can be added on, increase your cover, increase your premiums. But you will need to probably ring up your insurer if you're not sure if you've got it to ask whether you have a guaranteed insurability option on your policy and when you do ring up make sure you use those words because there are a lot of people who will be working at the insurance companies who might not know really what you're talking about when you say you want to increase your cover etc and not realize that you're referring to this particular option of guaranteed insurability use those words then it will cut through all the confusion they'll suddenly go ah i get what you mean and then they will be able to go and find out if you've got it and therefore you may be able to use it and and just on that generally guaranteed insurability options are driven by a particular event in your life so most insurers will ask you whether you have maybe got married had a child taken on a new mortgage and you'd need to tick one of those boxes before they'll allow you to take out that option so it isn't for everyone and the other thing to add on to that is that it usually is only for say 10 percent of the total sum assured that you had before and it can also be a cap on the how much it can give you in totality as well so it won't necessarily be sufficient for your needs but it's better than nothing for some people it's an option the other thing is look at your death in service at work if you're employed you may end up having a death in service benefit so if you die it may pay out a particular amount of insurance The, the, the reason to also look at it is because you may be able to increase the amount of cover on that policy now way they usually work if you have a group scheme of some kind then they don't look at the health of every individual in that company the way they underwrite it they underwrite it on mass effectively so what it means is it is possible to get insurance under a group scheme with less underwriting than you would if you were taking that personally which would be good for somebody like me who has medical issues they wouldn't even care about my medical issues because you're taken as a group risk hence the name of a group insurance policy but what's key is that usually say for example you had three times salary was your benefit some of the schemes can allow for individuals to have up to 20 times their salary as a benefit now theoretically you could go to your employer and don't forget most employers don't really understand their own benefits that they have in place but you could go to your employer and say look i want more life insurance and so could you speak to the insurance company of increasing my multiple of salary? I will pay for that increase. It will cost the company nothing, but you could pay for it via salary sacrifice, which basically means you pay for it from your gross pay, which therefore is tax efficient as well for you. So in a roundabout way, it reduces the cost from your net perspective. So there are ways you could increase it on your company scheme if you can't get cover personally. The other thing is to bear in mind is that you can sometimes get cover for your spouse on a group scheme. So in theory, you could have a couple who both have their own group schemes at their work where they have a death in service benefit and each of them could ask to be covered under the others group scheme at their respective employers so there is a bit of work involved you might have to talk to them and ask i don't know why lots of people are very afraid to ask about their employee benefits they don't want to rock the boat but that's why they're there employers put them there for a reason And therefore, you just need to ask your HR. And I mean, this is important stuff. So it's worth having that conversation because it would be nice if employers were thinking about this themselves and suddenly thinking to people, do you know, we could do this for anybody who is worried about life insurance cover. We could increase this. doesn't increase what the company is going to contribute. We can't afford to do that. But you could if you wanted to. And there are some people out there who may want to do that. And of course, as an employer, you should be trying to talk about it. Now, most group schemes start from around 10 people. And a kind of an extra note onto this is that you could get to a scenario, which is really a side note, where somebody who is, let's say there was somebody who was running a company and they've got no life insurance and they've suddenly, this has all dawned on them and they want to try and take some out, but they're stressed, they've got health issues, they've not been able to get any cover be postponed if they run their company and they've got 10 employees they could take out a group scheme through their company which covers their employees 
it's going to obviously going to cost the company but it would also cover them but they wouldn't have to be medically underwritten as an individual so there is also that benefit so company directors out there who have health problems can actually use a group life insurance scheme to get cover themselves if they wanted to but it's also a benefit for employees oh, so yeah it works for both the company owner and also the employees as well yeah and then one final point before we move on to andy's quick piece on the buying a house is that don't forget when you buy a life insurance policy you don't have to have it forever if you get a policy now and it's expensive Expensive and more than you want it to pay you can in future go and what they call in the in the industry rebroke it you could go and take out another policy go and apply again with a different insurer with a, an advisor and if it's cheaper which it could be then you would take that policy and once you've got that policy cancel your old one so you don't have to stick with the insurer you've got forever we shop around for lots of other bills it is possible to shop around on on insurances such as life insurance income protection of course they will take into account your circumstances every time and any changes in your circumstances every time you apply for a new policy so if you've your health has deteriorated then it's unlikely it's going to be cheaper but it's worth pointing out because i don't want people to not take out life insurance it's an important product that people do overlook and i think this current environment 2020 is a nice reminder as to the importance of it okay that moves us on nicely to the last piece of the pod and it's really just a quick piece to touch on there's been some changes to the shared ownership scheme now we've We've covered it before in the podcast. Uh, we'll link to an article where we explain what shared ownership is and who could benefit from it uh, in the podcast notes. But this week there was an announcement made and it's a timely announcement because we've seen in the news in recent weeks about certain mortgages being pulled from the market. There's a lot of negativity around for first time buyers struggling to get on the property ladder. And so there's been some news on the shared ownership scheme, which should be good news for some. So currently with shared ownership, it allows people to buy a poor of a property. So those that can't afford to take on 100%, they can look to a shared ownership scheme and it gives those the ability to own a percentage of the property and you then pay a rent on the rest. And that is managed by a housing association and you're protected from those rents going up excessively. And it's a good way for, to ease people onto the property ladder. There's also ways that you can then over time purchase additional shares and eventually own that home yourself. And it's sort of a good way in for some. We won't dwell on it too much because we've covered it before and I will link to an article that explains about the scheme. One of the key things being, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that it's on new build properties. Well, there's some light at the end of the tunnel because that 25%, the minimum of 25% is now being relaxed. And so anyone looking to be a part of this scheme can from 2021 purchase a smaller percentage as 10%. So whereas it used to be a minimum of 25%, they've reduced that right down to 10%. And you think on a £300,000 property, you've only got to find a mortgage of £30,000. Of course, there's still going to be affordability tests. You still have to prove that you can afford the rent on the other 90%, but it will allow people with smaller deposits to get a foot on the ladder. Is that from April 2021? It is. Uh, April. So April 2021. I do wonder whether this is all coming into the stamp duty holiday there. Exactly. They're knowing the market's going to go. There's going to be a big explosion, a big pop at some point, and they thought we need to. Throw but this out is only some... this is only new build. So people are already on the scheme. They if they they've seen a benefit too to this, have they? Yeah, so there's no benefit to the ones that are on the scheme in terms of the percentage. They're already on the ladder. They purchased at twenty at the minimum of 25 or higher. But there has been another rule change whereby those people, if they wanted previously to own more of their property, they could only do so in 10% chunks. So let's say if you own 50%, if you wanted to own more, you'd have to go for at least 60% or then 70%. It's 10% minimum chunks. But they've relaxed that right back now. And so they've reduce those chunks to 1% increments. So you could effectively say from April 2021, you could buy 10% of a property and then incrementally increase it up by 1% at a time. I don't know why you'd do that because there'll be certain costs associated. There'll be legal costs and et cetera, but it gives more flexibility. For example, for someone who didn't want to do 10%, they could do 5% or if they didn't want to do 20%, they could meet somewhere in the middle and do 15. There's just far more flexibility. It should mean that people are moving towards owning their own home quicker. And they're encouraged to do so. It seems to be, yeah, because if if there's a big chunk, a big jump, then the the hurdle is higher so yeah I, I i see that so that's from next year good 
So we've been some positives on the on the podcast, the life insurance and the property part. So if you if you buy a house on the shared ownership, make sure you go and get life insurance, as I explained yeah, in yeah. the previous piece. So yeah. there we go. It all comes back together. Right, we're done. So that's it for this week. If you want to contact Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter is at money to the masses. Remember to. We're on Instagram. And don't forget, if you haven't already done so, we've seen loads of people join this week. Join our Facebook group. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash money to the mass so that is it for this week Andy until next time make sure you leave a review that we had some good reviews this week which we will endeavor to read out some of them in the future until next time Bye.